Greetings to everyone joining us. My name is Alex Toscano and I'm Vice Chair of London Art Week and I should like to thank all of you who have so enthusiastically participated in London Art Week Digital, joining us for our talks and our online events. You've all helped to make this such an optimistic event despite current constraints. Today you'll be treated to a conversation about collecting sculpture through the ages. Our moderator is Dr Luke Sison, Director of the Fitzwilliam Museum and the former Chairman of European Sculpture and Decorative Arts at the Metropolitan Museum in New York. And before that, he held curatorial positions at the National Gallery, the V&A and the British Museum in London, and most notably was instrumental in securing Raphael's Madonna of the Pinks for the nation. He also curated that fabulous exhibition on Leonardo in 2011 at the National Gallery. Joining us is Catherine Zock, a private art advisor to collectors and institutions, specializing in sculpture from the Renaissance to the Baroque. She's also vice president and director of the Friends of the Bargello, a not-for-profit charity set up in both the UK and the United States to give direct philanthropic support to the Bargello Museum in Florence, which is such a seminal world-class museum for lovers of sculpture. We're delighted to have with us from the States, Mark Plonskier, who apart from currently being a trustee of the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, having also been a trustee of other arts institutions, is a philanthropist and a collector himself, and as such is what we'd like to call an end user. His collecting interests are wide ranging and began with modern paintings, but he's got the sculpture bug and can recount firsthand the challenge and the adventure involved in collecting high quality three-dimensional art. Finally, we have Georg Lauer, a second generation dealer of Kunstkammer, precious objects, curiosities, sculpture and works of art in Munich and in London. Georg is also an art historian, a curator and a publisher, and like Catherine, has helped form wonderful collections. His boundless energy and passion does much to introduce sculpture and objects to a younger generation, a collector. So I hope you're going to enjoy the conversation and will submit your questions to the panel for discussion at the end of this talk. So with no further ado, I shall hand you over to Luke Sison. Thank you very much, Alex. It's really lovely that you were able, all of you, to join us this evening. Um, so I'd like to say uh, hello from my kitchen in Cambridge. Um, and I hope that you'll forgive my homemade haircut. That's the best I could do in this last um, three months. Um, I'm, um, I'm really excited to, um, to, to drill down on this question of, of, of collecting sculpture, what sculpture, why, why, why sculpture in particular. Um, it's, it's something obviously I thought about a great deal when, when buying for um, the Met, um, not least uh, from, from Georg, from some fantastic um, German pieces that, that entered, the, um, entered the Met's collection at that point. And now, of course, at the Fitz, um, where we have a distinguished collection of bronzes, um, thinking about how those might be displayed um, in, in the future. And just um, to let you know that I hope very much that people will come visit those bronzes when we reopen to the public in the first or second week um, of August. Um, so perhaps I should begin. Um, Alex described Mark as a real person, which um, earlier on when we were chatting, which means that what she meant was that he was a real collector. So somebody who's, 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 um, who's thinking hard about what he actually wants to, to live with, we be surrounded by. Um, and I'm guessing that's in your own home, but perhaps Mark, you could just begin by characterizing your collection and just talking a little bit about how sculpture fits into it. Yeah, well, um, I've, uh, I've learned to accept my dear friend Ronnie Baer's characterization of my, char my collection or our collection as eclectic. And in fact, it, it is eclectic. Uh, our collection only numbers about 100 works uh, and all of them are on, on view in my house. <laughs> um, they span from the earliest, which is an Egyptian wooden uh, face, actually a head uh, dating from about 2000 BC, uh, which by the way is uh, Abraham, Sarah, Hagar, and Ishmael, that's when they were around. So, so it was very interesting to go back and connect it to 
to uh, what was really happening at the time, and uh, that was quite startling. Uh, so it goes from about that to uh, a, a set of Sophie Kell uh, photographs of empty Gardner Museum frames. And so uh, uh, it, it ranges from uh, 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 pockets in 16th, 17th century, then in 19th and early 20th century, and then a few rooms of contemporary. But um, so I look at art really across the board, uh, and but I only fall in love about five times a year. And uh, I'm not looking to fill holes in a collection. Uh, rather, I, I look to be drawn to a work, and then somehow I have to figure out how to fit it in and where to hang it and so forth. And it's the fact is, as, as a collector, rehanging is one of the great joys of collecting. You, you know, you're in control and, and uh, connections that I might see uh, might be something a, 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 a real curator wouldn't and it's for my enjoyment. So I find rehanging to be a wonderful thing. My wife uh, uh, sometimes is, is a bit put off because I generally do the rehanging uh, in the middle of the night and so she'll wake up and walk into a room and all of a sudden it's completely different. But um, so that's really, uh, you know, my sense of it is, is, is. And, and Mark, I mean, it's interesting that you talk about rehanging. I'm, 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 I'm struck that that's a word that, that really belongs in the world of painting in mm. some ways. Um, can you talk a bit about how sculpture kind of comes into this collection and, and you know, how, 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 how do you live with it? Because I'm always struck, you know, I'm struck now as we're thinking about museums reopening that it's much easier to reopen a, a, a paintings gallery where everything's essentially arrayed a, around the walls than, than what do you do when you're living with three-dimensional objects? They kind of demand, they, they're sharing your space in a different way, aren't they? Yeah, I think, well, first of all, I think that the fact that museums traditionally, it was painting, 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 and you'd walk into a gallery and, you know, it, it became, you know, not tedious, but uh, uh, they were all, everything was the same. And so, but when museums began to lead the way, I think, in having galleries that might have uh, sculpture, might have decorative arts, uh, particularly decorative arts, uh, it becomes alive. And um, so uh, I met, so sorry, Catherine. I met Catherine and uh, Catherine Zock and Adrian Butterworth uh, a number of years ago at Tafoff in Maastricht. And at some point, I, I walked around the fair with Catherine looking at sculpture. Um, uh, uh, I had been advised the night before by our late friend, Hester Diamond, uh, uh, at the Crown Plaza, right late at night. She told me, stay away from bronzes, period. <laughs> she said that, you know, at that time, she was collecting terracotta. And uh, George uh, here will attest to her quickness in, in, in moving on things. And, uh, but she did acquire a, a gorgeous alabaster relief uh, of Leonard Kern out from under all of our noses one year. But uh, anyways, that all worked out, George. Um, but her point of view was, was that bronzes were less well understood. And so, you know, caveat emptor, let the buyer beware. Uh, but with, with a, a, a lot of looking at bronzes and with expert advice, and thank you, Catherine, I began to understand some basics. And I've also had the privilege of, of being uh, in Boston with the, you know, the very fine Museum of Fine Arts Boston collection. And our senior sculpture curator, Marietta Camberreri, uh, one day she invited me a bunch of years ago to go behind the scenes. So uh, she had me put on gloves and handed me a fabulous Renaissance bronze. And now she spotted me underneath because, you know, um, it was really revelatory, the weight of it, the feel of it. And so sculpture, you know, unpainted sculpture at any rate, um, it, it, it has a uniform color, right? It's either usually brown or black or silver or whatever it is. And perspective gets created by light. And so, you know, it, a great sculpture uses the natural light to bounce off of the work and, and, and in a sense it gives it color and the depth creates, creates an image. And so uh, you can take a sculpture and you have an unlimited number of images. You turn it this way, it looks different. This way, continue. Or you, you look at it in the morning or in the afternoon. You look at it before you turn on the lights 
uh, uh, and it it gives you a different viewpoint. So it's completely it's completely different. And and I think that um, it's because you know a sculpture is you said Luke it occupies space. You know it invades your space, uh, it, it, and it invites you to touch it. And so, sorry, another Catherine story. Um, you know you want to sort of run your hand along it. So um, I. Uh, uh, I went to the V&A with uh, Catherine, and we were with uh, Peter Matur, who is the V&A's uh, great uh, senior sculpture curator. And uh, we were looking at a bronze in the gallery outside of glass. And at one point, Catherine reaches out and she runs her hand along it and she touches it before she realized, oh my, you know, you know it's, probably, it's probably not okay. Um, but, uh, I thought about that and I thought about the bronzes that I had in my house and the small bronzes and I suddenly realized, my God, you can touch these things if you're a collector. And so I took two bronzes, uh, each one was about 30 centimeters, the other about 50 centimeters high and I put it on my desk. And it was amazing because I can reach out and I can touch it and I can, I can look at it in different light and I can turn it around and, and I suddenly felt I was, I was like one of those uh, 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 diplomats who received a, a gift of one of these small bronzes from, from Rubens of Jim Bologna and, and uh, uh, I can imagine him sitting there looking at it in candlelight on his desk writing something. And so it really felt, I felt connected to it. And, Mark, that's absolutely fascinating. I mean, I think there's a, a range of things that you brought up. One is that you clearly ignored Hester's advice and bronzes. Yeah. <laughs> the, second, the second, I think, is really fascinating, talking about your interactions with Catherine, but also with Marietta and with, with Peter, that what you're describing is a kind of um, combination of the sensual and the scholarly in a really, in a really fascinating way, that, that kind of sense of expertise but also that, that way in which the interaction with a, with a sculpture, either you moving around it or it moving around, you know, you, you, you manipulating it to give it this sort of energy and light is, is, a, really, is a really key factor. Um, Georg, I guess um, my question then to you to, to, to address the theme is of this, of this, of this session, you, you, you know, you're, you're one of the people who's really, um, who's really explored a kind of Kunstkammer aesthetic, this idea of the art chamber in the, in the Renaissance um, and so on. And how much do you think that the original intentions of the, of the, of the makers and collectors of the, of the works of art that you, you're so expert in still, um, still function and, and trend, uh, you know, still, uh, still operate today um, among, among the collecting um, fraternity? Mm. Um. I, I do think it's a very important um, point still today. And Mark, I, I, I totally agree with you. I mean, all these wonderful um, sculptures and Kunstkammer objects, um, they have to be touched. You have to admire them. You have to take them in your hand. Um, as you just said, most of them are small scale. Um, they're very intimate pieces. And um, they really were made for connoisseurs. And uh, it's still the same today. Um, as it maybe was uh, Rudolf II, he used to have these um, little wonderful sculptures in his bedroom, even we don't, we know that, and he had them uh, just next, st standing next to his bed. Um, I know from many, many collectors um, who just uh, love their items so much, um, even today in the modern times, um, the Renaissance objects, that they really have them next to their living room, dining room, sleeping room. Um, what's also important um, was always the, the value of the material. Um, we should never forget that um, all these um, tiny little sculptures made for Kunstkammer, they were made out of coral sometimes, even amber, um, alabaster, ivory, uh, boxwood. So all these precious um, materials which you couldn't have um, very easily and if if you were able to, um, to find such a piece, um, it was something very special. You were sitting around a table, um, inviting diplomats, um, other collectors, um, or other aristocrats, and you were showing them your new acquisitions, and this shows that you, were, that you had the intellect, that you were able um, 
to acquire these things because you had a lot enough money, but you also had the connections to the art dealer um, or to, to the art agent uh, in this time um, who knows where to get these pieces. So um, even in the 16th centuries, we had these famous art dealers like Philipp Heinhofer, who he, li he lived in Augsburg and he was uh, traveling all over in the world, finding these great things and selling them to, to the Medici or to the um, Saxon aristocrats. Um, so um, it's not such a really big difference uh, for today. I will, it's the same for us, um, for us, the art dealers or like Catherine, the art advisors, traveling all over the world, finding these great things. Um, and and um, they will always find um, a good collector like Mark uh, who love them and who love these pieces and admire them like uh, 400 years ago. Yeah, well, thank you. I mean, I must say, I, the one thing I, I would um, maybe uh, want to sort of discuss more if we had more time is, is whether people still appreciate that variety of materials. I have a feeling that the, the sense of what a great sculpture is may have narrowed itself down a bit to bronze, mm. marble, maybe terracotta, rather than thinking, of, I mean, I think we're just beginning in the last few years to re-explore the world of polychromy, to think about, um, I guess ivories have now have their own problem, problematic aspect to them, but it's an interesting question yeah. um, to, to think about whether that part is really fully translated in, 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 the, in the same way, I guess. I guess I'm, but I'm very struck by what you say about the intimacy and the movement. When I first arrived at the Met, um, Mrs. kindly donated her extraordinary antico bronze of, of the Spinario to, um, to the Met. And when I next saw her, she, was, she came and she said, what have you done with Goldilocks? What have you done with Goldilocks? Um, <laughs> and, and I said, uh, we put her here. And, she, and she'd lived with him by her bed. Um, for most of the time that um, she'd had him since the 1950s. It was a, so you're right, I think there's a kind of, that intimacy aspect is very interesting. Catherine, um, you're, you, have, you have several hats, but one of them is as very much a kind of the, the great supporter and champion of the, the Bargello in, in, in Florence, where of course a museum environment creates a different kind of interaction with, with, with sculpture um, and maybe a different, history of, of how these works were ac accumulated, including monumental pieces and, and so on. And of course, the, the, um, the, the one of the glories of the Bargello is that, is that painting, well, so I'm being shown my biases, The painting takes a bit of a back, a back seat. It's not the most visited museum in, in Florence. So, so how, how, how would you sort of champion that experience of working, of, of, of interacting with sculpture in a, in a, in a great museum, looking at that long history and, and how we respond to it now? Well, well I think that the answer lies in probably the whole underlining theme of, of our talk this evening in that, you know, three-dimensional works of art by nature are more, they ask more of us and they're more challenging, whether they're monumental in size or whether they're small, like the objects uh, behind uh, George um, tonight, you know, they, they all, they're, it's, it's difficult to step out and interact with something, whereas a painting asks much less of us. It's a little more of a, of a inward journey with a painting. You can stand in front of it and observe it without anyone really needing to know what you might be thinking. You might even pretend you're in some sort of deep, you know, contemplative thought, and you can sort of get away with it. Um, sculpture doesn't really permit that. You know, you really, when you stand in front of, I mean, I've seen time and time again, people standing in front of a piece of sculpture. And I mean, the word embarrassment is, is the wrong word, but there's a sense of sort of, uh, being self-conscious maybe about, you know, how should I be reacting to this thing in front of me, um, whether it's small again or whether it's large. And that discomfort is, I would argue, the greatest barrier, I think, for the public to sculpture. One can discuss the academia behind it as being something that maybe is a deterrent, but 
I think more than anything that it's that. It's the physicality of it. And those of us who love it are just love that whole challenge of it. Um, and when you feel you've sort of conquered it, and again, that's probably the wrong word too, but when you feel comfortable with it, I should say, and it becomes part of you, particularly when you begin living with sculpture. I mean, I was talking with Mark the other day about it. You can't imagine it not being in your space anymore. It's, it's genuinely a bit like Goldilocks, um, you know. You, they really are things that you have a relationship with. Mm -hmm. And I, I believe, and I'm, I'm not the best person to say this for sure, but I believe that it's a relationship you can't have with paintings, or it's certainly a very different relationship with paintings. And to swing back to the Bargello, which of course is incredibly important to me, is I think when you walk then into a space as majestic um, as the Bargello, filled with sculpture of monumental and, and small sizes, I think it's genuinely overwhelming to people. Yeah. I think it, you can draw it back to that simple, you know, of a explanation. Um, and there are, I could talk for hours about the areas of, you know, promotion that needs to go on with the museum and elevating it. And I mean, there's, you know, the, the work that the Friends of the Bargello, uh, you know, aim to achieve in terms of raising awareness of the museum is an entirely, in a way, different conversation. But to keep it focused on sculpture, I would say that it's, it's, it's becoming more comfortable with sculptures. So I think um, uh, certainly maybe improving the didactics at the museum and explaining the, the genesis of the museum. So the heart of the museum is indeed the collection of the Medici, which one could argue is the oldest private collection in the world, right? So you're invited into this collection, um, which is a reflection of, you know, the sort of civic and political and cultural heart of, uh, of Italy and Florence, which was uh, the ambition of every other city in the world at the time. So there's a lot to take in when you walk into the Bargello, and I think it's a lack of comfort that keeps it. That, in Catherine, that's such a fascinating point. I mean, so maybe you're right that I think there's a kind of, it's, it, you know, there's the, the question of how something shares a space. Yeah. I've always been very struck by how there's a certain kind of energy in, especially in a great sculpture that, um, that has a, um, that, that needs, that needs to be accommodated somehow. Yeah. And that, yeah, maybe conquer isn't quite the wrong word. It's, you know, there's a kind of question of taming it by, by walking around it, by, by experiencing it, by handling it, by a form of, of interaction, because otherwise it's separateness from you is, is, is quite challenging in an odd sort of way. And I think when you're, um, yes, Mark, I was gonna I ask. Just, you know, just, I just wanted to say that, that I think that uh, people are able to have a relationship with sculpture even in museums, I, I, I'll notice uh, at the MFA, the number of uh, uh, young women posing like the little dancer, the Degas little dancer, I mean, they've stopped taking photos of it because it, it, everyone does it. Um, the same thing is true of, uh, uh, well, I shouldn't maybe say this online, but of Botero sculptures in terms of people going and touching. Um, and so I think, uh, and at the MFA, we just, uh, they just installed, uh, I can't remember, two, three years ago, a Kunstkammer gallery, probably inspired by Georg, I think. And, and the fact is, it's one of the most popular places to go. People who I know who have no connection to sculpture really connect with the, 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 the sort of concentration of gorgeous objects and even beautiful small pictures. So I think it's possible, and perhaps it's the job of museums to, to per, you know, move that forward so that people get that kind of experience in galleries. I think that's absolutely right. Did you, I mean, I'm going slightly off, 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 off order because I think you're quite right in saying that, but did you feel you were making a leap? Did you have to conquer embarrassment or, 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 um, or, 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 or recognize yeah, I, that you were I, I, taking a step in, um, in moving into a different 
Yeah, you know, um, so I came from the world of business. So, you know, in business, you know, you try to, you mitigate risk so that you know exactly what you're doing. And so when you move into a sculpture, um, there are more challenges, I would say. And the learning curve is, you know, it's quite deep. Um, so to tell the difference between a, a, a Sassini cast of a Giambologna and, 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 a, and a Taka, you know, uh, that, I'm not interested in that, to be honest. I mean, I think you all should be, but I'm not that interested. What I'm interested in is, is having, having a deep emotional reaction to yeah. an object. And uh, when you stop being afraid of those objects, which, which um, you know, Catherine and Georg have helped me tremendously, um, it becomes um, really very enriching. So, and Mark, do you think that that fear was was simply not knowing the field, or was there something intrinsic to the medium itself that? Um, well, that I, 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 look, I hate to keep keep coming back to museums, but um, you know, I visited museums for so many years where they were just all paintings, and yeah, there were sculptures somewhere. Um, and and forgive me for taking aim at the Bargello, but. Uh, I visited Bargello several times and could not get into the room of small bronzes because for budgetary purposes, it was closed. Um, well, Catherine, Catherine will help solve that um, going <laughs> forward. Um, so, so, Georg, I mean, when, when, when people um, uh, come, say, onto your stand at, 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 at Maastricht, or um, as you, as you, um, or as you're now working with, with, with Stuart in, in London and Stuart Lockheed and so on. Is there, a, is there a sense that you feel that you need to lead people over, a, over a, a kind of, you know, is there a jump that people need to make in order to, to, to start collecting the, the three-dimensional? And um, again, how much, does, do you, how, much, how much do you feel that um, you or, or indeed we in museums have to, to help educate people about how to look at this this material, how to respond, how to be relaxed, and so relaxed, in fact, that you know that that you you get beyond the sort of the the re, the recreation of the pose, which I agree with Mark is a is a classic way of responding in a in a in a museum. But but when you're at Maastricht, you would feel a bit idiotic idiotic doing that, I suspect. So what what, what are the what are the things that you 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 do and talk about in terms of developing a um, of, of helping a collector make that jump? I'll come to you. Kathy ask the same same question in a, in a second i must say look sorry Gail, just before you answer yeah. i'm saying that there's no um so um alex mentioned at the beginning the chance to ask questions do just type them into the chat if people have them and i'll try and make sure that i'm monitoring the the conversations we as we go forward if people if people want Very to yeah. try and make sure we've got some time at the end to ask some of those questions Gail, sorry so it was, um, let's say I'm, I'm doing Maastricht, um, TIF of Maastricht now for more than 22, 23 years. And when I started doing this fair, for example, um, this was a big challenge for the people coming to my stand, to my booth, and they said, oh, what's going on here? What, what is this guy doing? Now, um, 25 years later, it's different. The people, they sometimes come to my stand and say, oh, George, you have to go to this and this museum. I have seen this and this great Kunstkammer over there. And, Go and have you seen this this wonderful exhibition in the in the in the Metropolitan making marvels? And I said yes, I've been to the opening. So the people are really aware now. They know what's a Kunstkammer. They know they're used to um, to go to museums to exhibitions, and um, so it's it's it's, it's wonderful. Um, so it's not a big step anymore for me. Um, the people are used um, to look at these things. They they want to collect them, and um, what's nice about this is that we have more and more young collectors um, who admire these different fields and the different materials. So um, we had a wonderful collector called Reinhard Winkler. He just died, was 95 years, some, yes, last, last year, and he was the biggest ivory collector in, in Europe. So he was only focused on ivory. This, is, this we, don't, we, we don't have this anymore. Um, we have collectors who they, they buy um, whatever they like. Like Mark, um, if he get touched by an object, it can be a Renaissance bronze, it can be an ivory, it can be an amber piece, it can be alabaster. He wants to have it. It has to be the quality, the provenance must be good, the condition, and if you are moved by the object and by the quality, then you buy it. So this is, um, we are a stick, big, big step forward. And what you just mentioned with the Boston Museum, um, with the Kunstkammer, that this is the mm. most famous place there. This is, this, I'm thrilled about that. It's great news. 
And again, all credit to Marietta Camborari um, yes. <laughs> and, Tom, and Tom for, for, for making it so so beautiful. Um, the um, so I was I was I'm very so one question, Catherine. Maybe this is too banal, but I um, I'm one of the great collectors of of sculpture and indeed um, old master painting um, in um, North America. Began with sculpture because his walls got filled up. Um, so there was a kind of sense that you move from the walls into the into the room. Talk a little bit about that that move from um, from 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 painting, perhaps if that's where the beginning is, to to sculpture, and what what that jump again from your perspective um, looks like. Well, first of all, I just want to respond to something that Georg said because I felt he was being a little modest there because I, I believe from where I sit that dealers um, are as instrumental as museums and curators in helping the collector overcome some of these um, obstacles towards looking and experimenting and interacting with the three-dimensional world. And, I would say that Georg is probably amongst the top, um, you know, dealers to be able to be in that privileged position to do that successfully. And while he's experienced a breakthrough, I think it's really important that he realizes that he's a huge part of that. I think the, um, the commitment that he's maintained towards his area of um, speciality is massively important. It adds a sort of integrity to the area. He's not looking at what's fashionable and changing it to sort of respond more to the public or, oh, maybe I should throw some modern paintings behind this so that it's maybe better observed or more comfortable for people. You know, he sort of ref refused to do that and has um, stayed, um, honest to what he deals in, um, in the very top sort of quality of that area. So I think it's hugely important. And on a same uh, tier, I would say, as the responsibility that museums and curators uh, have for the same purposes. So I just wanted to say that because- I completely, I completely agree, may I Hugely just, important. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, I completely agree. Despite having spent my entire professional life in museums, I'm very, very clear that, so, that it's quite often the museum uh, following, not always, but following a, a establishing a, a, the, the establishment of a market rather than necessarily right. the other way around. Um, so Mark, some questions are beginning to come in and I'm beginning to see where they I found on my screen where they actually are. Um, um, not, nothing is for sale. Nothing is for sale. <laughs> well, but of course not. You're waiting to give it to the Fitzwilliam Museum. Um, <laughs> the, um, the, um, no, the question I was going to ask with, um, on behalf of one of the people at the, uh, uh, listening is, are there, I mean, uh, are there any, any questions that now you'd go back and say, I wish I'd asked that right at the beginning about your collecting activity. Is there something that now you feel? That, well, I, I would say that, that, uh, uh, spending years only collecting paintings um, was a lost opportunity. Um, you know, uh, uh, for whatever reason, the art market, you know, continues to rise meteorically. I mean, it's, uh, uh, and so uh, it's unfortunate that some of the things that, that we're looking at now are, have gotten so expensive and probably could have been bought 20 years ago, uh, you know, better. But uh, other than that, I, I would say no, uh, just, uh, you know, Georg opened my eyes to different materials. You know, I had never seen anything like it. You know, when I, when I first uh, saw Georg's booth at, uh, in Maastricht, it was, it was like a, a treasure chest. You know, it was almost like you're transported back in history and all of these jewel-like things, you know, whether it's a rock crystal or it's a, a shell or it's, you know, uh, it's, it's just extraordinary. Um, and the idea that all these other things are art, you know, qualify as art and enrich my living situation, um, I, I can't see now how I would ever think of collecting in any other way other than 
um, trying to create a rich environment. And, and uh, these objects, these precious objects are part of that. Um, Catherine, one, another question that's come up is around um, the kind of accoutrements, if you like, or atmosphere of, of sculpture. As an advisor, do you, do you think, of, do you also give advice on pedestals and, and, and plinths and the original, you know, how, how, because how to display a piece of sculpture is a really great question. And indeed, how to light it. I mean, is that, is that something that you, uh, that yeah. you're... Yeah, I would say, and, uh, you know, it, it could in fact be one of the sort of obstacles that people have in fact with sculpture is, oh, you know, I, I like this piece of sculpture, but maybe I like it in part because I like the pedestal that it's on and the light that it's on and my house isn't like that and will I be able to show it and live with it with the same enjoyment. So yes, that does, that is part of it. But I think um, really I've found that that's very much in the early stages um, of becoming comfortable with uh, three-dimensional works of art that there's this concern of how I'm going to display it. And I think once you get through, and yes, of course, you know, I'm, I sort of help and facilitate in those areas, but I think once people learn how you can live with sculpture and how it can be done successfully, um, that becomes less of, a, less of a concern. And one realizes that there's a solution for nine out of 10 of these, uh, these issues. When except, one for, except, except for space. You run out of space. That's the only problem. That's what museums are for. The, <laughs> the, um, and Georg, um, um, one of the things that, that's come up a lot, I think, in the last few years in terms of sculpture on when it's for sale at, at, at somewhere at, at Tefa, for example, or, at, um, uh, or indeed in, 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 in galleries as, as now, is, is the question of lighting, I suppose daylighting versus dramatic um, um, kind of, as it were, candlelight or the, the spotlight, the kind of thing that my um, brilliant former colleague um, Xavier Bray did in the um, Sacred Made, Meal, Made Real, with very dramatic lighting and polychrome sculpture. Your, your, um, your stand tends to be um, uh, on the, um, uh, dark side with, with quite a lot of uh, a very brilliant lighting of pieces. Is that, is that because you think that that's how these pieces were viewed or is it because again that makes them somehow come alive now in a different way? Um, I always want that these things um, don't are really shown in a really bright light like you, sh you should not have the feeling like you're going in a in a hospital to say like that, you know, so I, I want, I want, I want to have a nice atmosphere. Um, and if you, I visit my, my clients very often, I, I go to their private houses and in, in these houses, the objects never are in, in totally light areas. They're standing in a living room, as I just said, or uh, next to, um, next, in the library and in all these places are very dark. And sometimes you can only see them by daylight and the people, um, go there when it's nearly dark or not so so this is I, I want really I want to create the atmosphere um, um, a home atmosphere or maybe the atmosphere as it was in the, in the 16th 17th century so um, we can always always when I enter a church I, I, I try to to imagine how, how this must have been for, for the visitors four or five hundred years ago with only with candle lights you know and and um, we are now so used to this um, spectacular lightning in, in all uh, public places. But um, so I want to show it different. But on the other hand, my, my stands are always very modern. So I have a, also a very modern wall, a concrete wall. Uh, with a com so it's a combination of, of contemporary um, uh, presentation and, and uh, the, the Renaissance atmosphere. I think that's absolutely right. I remember Jennifer Montague saying to me, many years ago that she thought the best illuminator of sculpture was God, um, yes. <laughs> natural light. But I have to say, I've never agreed. Um, <laughs> the, um, um, and when I think recent, more recently about, about you know, the, the research that's being done on the candlelit tour of the marble gallery and so on and so forth, it's, it becomes really important. So these questions were inspired by uh, my brilliant colleague at the Fitzwilliam, Vicky Avery. Um, I'm, I didn't know was here, but I'm pleased to see that she is. Um, Georg, another question on, on, a, on appeal and, and, and value, if you like. Um, 
what happens when, um, the, what's the difference between a, 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 an anonymous piece and one where you can attach a name? And how, what happens when, you, when you're able to develop um, the, the sense of an artistic personality, when you, when, you, when you are able to establish what the oeuvre of a particular sculptor looks like? Um, talk, a bit about, talk a little bit about authorship, because Mark said yeah. he doesn't really care which Suzini made this particular, um, particular bronze, but some people do. And I, I guess I'm interested in, in that question of, of authorship um, and how much that matters. I mean, for the art market, it's much easier if you find a Leonard Kern, um, Alabaster or Ivory, which is monogram LK. So it's no doubt about it. And it's, it's a wonderful piece. Little doubt about it anyway. Go on. Sometimes. <laughs> but but um, um, very often um, the monogram pieces are even not the, the best ones because they were made for the art market even in the 17th century. So um, all the wonderful um, Leonard Kern or Balthasar Griezmann sculptures in the Kunsthistorische Museum in Vienna, they have no monograms because they were directly made for the Austrian court. So, um, but um, back to your question, um, I always try to find new projects and um, or try to find um, artists um, where you probably sometimes don't even know a lot about it and or, or almost nothing. So um, I just did a publication two years ago on the master of the St. Sebastian Materidum. And um, because I found a relief, uh, no signature, um, no date, nothing, because there is no signature for the, all of these um, works by this artist. And um, so it's an anonymous artist uh, named after two ivory reliefs in, in Vienna. And um, I thought it's worth doing a catalogue raisonné just on this um, sculpture. And since I published my book two years ago, there were two other um, items on the market. So sometimes it's really helpful um, to do this research and to make catalogs. And um, I, I must say for the worth of the object, if it's, if it's easier to sell or if you get more money for the item, if it's signed or not, um, I must agree with Mark. I think the, it's about the quality. It's um, if the if the item is in its best quality and um, it can be signed or can be monogrammed, has no signature, you um, you get the, the price the object deserves. I, I think that that has to be right. I, I I mean one of the pieces I was most proud of buying for the for the Met um, with um, very much aided and abetted by Wolfram Kerper was the the Great Saint Sebastian by the Master of the Furies. And I never really minded whether, um, that, I mean, I think that attribution is correct to the extent that that person's oeuvre has been established, but I, that wasn't ever the point really, as far as I was concerned. It was just to me an extraordinary, yes. extraordinary um, work from, from that point of view. Let's talk a little bit about um, materials again. Um, the, um, the question has, uh, has been raised on the, uh, on the Q&A about, um, about wax. Um, as a medium. Um, and so we've talked about so far very, very precious media, um, bronze to some degree, marble, certainly alabaster, ivory. What about the transformation of, um, of relatively humble media um, by the great skill of a, of a particular artist, um, wax or, or clay? Um, Catherine, do you find, that's, um, do you find that, that there's a sort of resistance among collectors to those um, maybe more humble media, or, or is that a, because I'm always astonished by what bargains there are to be had among terrorists, yeah. frankly. I agree, I agree. I think you're, you know, in, in a funny way, it's almost the same area as the area of the previous question with, you know, works of art with, you know, attributions or not. You're entering into another sort of level of comfort with sculpture, you know, you're, you're I mean, you know, if I, come across something that I think is particularly wonderful and doesn't have an attribution and might be made of wax. You know, there are certain people that I know are flexible enough in their understanding of this market of three-dimensional art that I would approach with it. Whereas there are others that just simply wouldn't be able to sort of maybe want to go there, if you know what I mean, in terms of wanting to dig a little, you know, deeper in a way, because these things do demand that even more, I think. Um, and when you say wax, I suppose, you know, a whole range of 
you know, of uh, characteristically, you know, questions would come from that. Is it a wax model of a known bronze? Is it, uh, you know, is it, what date is it? You know, all these sort of criteria, which of course come into deciding whether it's something of, of art historical importance or whether it's just a ball of old wax, you know, which of course <laughs> it could be. So, you know, it's all those uh, things that come together. And I think that that obviously takes, you know, a greater, um, you know, academic approach to a, to a thing. Um, and the Mark, same you, yeah. So I, I would say that, um, you know, it's interesting. So wax, uh, for me, I'm, I'm concerned with what most usual normal people would be, which is, is, is the thing gonna melt? Can I take care of it? What do I have to do to make sure I don't uh, destroy it for future generations? So I'm a little reluctant. I mean, we've looked, Catherine and I have actually looked at a few and, but uh, plaster is a different story. You know, a very modest material um, and uh, perhaps even closer to the sculptor's hand than the bronze. So I find that very appealing um, although you know they're rare, and so it's a little more. Difficult. What about what about terracotta, Mark? Are you are you um, comfortable in that territory? Is that I'm, I'm I'm waiting for Georg to find uh, me a great one, and um, uh, yes, the answer is yes. <laughs> I, I I would love that. Um, uh, I I would say that uh, the other thing that Georg did, I just want to just mention it is, is he introduced me to relief, you know, relief as as a as an art form as a as an expression and, and, and it really, it was quite an eye opener. And so now I'm really quite interested in reliefs because. Uh... So another question for you, Mark, um, and um, as, as a collector, one, one, I guess if you were being, um, if you were, all you were thinking about was the, um, was the aesthetic power of an object, would the, and the, so, so a later cast of a, of a, a bronze compos composition, for example, could have almost the same degree of, of emotional impact, the, yeah. the, 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 the same, perhaps the same sort of energy. So and imagine that on the whole, you prefer yeah. that um, the, the cast was made as close to the lifetime or ideally supervised by the, the sculptor themselves, because then, because- No, I, actually I would- Somehow- Yeah, I would, right. say, I would say that, um, and sorry, sorry for stepping on your lines, um, but, um, I would say that uh, that's where it goes into the risk of owning a thing. And so I think that, uh, uh, yes, the first cast and the a later cast may be aesthetically identical. Let's, let's just say they're identical. Um, I think I'm, as a, as a prudent person, um, want to make sure that I have value. And what I've learned is, is even though something might cost four times as much because it's a, a lifetime cast versus a posthumous cast, still go for the lifetime cast pay because over time it will work out. Of course, many times the earlier cast is better. So uh, there is that. Interesting question, isn't it? Because sometimes, I mean, I, I agree with you, I have to say, but I also think that there's something usually when one talks about the energy of a work of art that um, that's contained by that closeness to to the artist, and you you can somehow sense it in an odd sort of way. Something deadening happens through the process of of reproduction that's hard to hard to um, hard to encapsulate. But I think it's it's there. So well, what's interesting, though, uh, Luke, is that you know modern sculpture is done in, are done in series. So let's say Lipschitz. You know, the, there's seven of them. So um, all of them are equally fine, I think, or generally speaking. I mean, I'm not an expert, but I think they're generally fine. And the same thing true of, of contemporary sculpture. So I think the problem is mostly in uh, old master sculptures. It's an interesting question. I mean, I was in, so I was in Harlow in Essex, which is a new town that was built in the 1950s uh, for bombed out EastEnders to move there. And it had an extraordinary sculpture um, campaign um, uh, them and it included, um, interestingly, a late Musée Rodin cast of Rodin's Eve, um, which now sits in a sort of shopping centre, and, and you can see it says five guys behind it, and, and you know, best coffee in Harlow. Um, and um, so one of the questions that's come up, and I guess it's a question that I, uh, that, that all of you might comment on, but perhaps Catherine 
um, as, a, as somebody who, who, with this connection to the Bargello, which has sort of half outdoor spaces, yeah. uh, to think a little bit about that relationship of, of, of sculpture in, in, our, in our civic spaces, in our shared spaces, and whether, whether we could do more with, with those works to, to bring them to life. It's obviously a very hot topic at the moment, given, given issues around the power of statuary in our, in our lives. Um, any thoughts on that? Well, um, if, if your question is whether, is what we could do uh, more? I guess, should, well, I guess my question might be, um, would, would we, are we happy or might we be happy to put more copies of great works of, of sculpture out in our streets again, um, uh, maybe sometimes replacing ones that are, are more uh, problematic in order to get people to feel sort of comfortable and happy with, 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 looking at, with looking at sculpture. Yes, no, it, I, 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 think, I think we're going to have to. I mean, I think that, um, you know, the current environment demands that of us. And, and I think that there needs to be a response. Um, and, you know, circling back to the Bargello, of course, as, as you well know, um, the majority of the large uh, sculpture within the Bargello um, would have originally have been out in public spaces, of which now in those spaces there are replicated sort of versions of the originals which are now in the Bargello. And of course, uh, the majority of those having been commissioned by Cosimo and various members of the Medici family for political and uh, you know, purposes. Um, I think that sculpture, uh, while the environment is entirely different, um, public sculpture does have a very similar purpose. Um, and as I say, in a very different environment. But I think that, um, again, when you're dealing with sculpture and the parameters that we've discussed it already in the past hour, if you take a piece of sculpture and it's, you know, over life size in a public space, it, it does make a statement. It makes an extremely loud statement. And I think that we uh, clearly, you know, um, given the current environment, need to be more uh, conscious of what that voice is. Um, and while again, it's a much larger subject, I, I, I do think that these works of art, we, we do need to listen to how they are affecting certain audiences. Um, but that the originals, um, you know, should be maintained somewhere, probably in museums, or, you know, that's probably a, will be a... I think that may be another, another discussion. For another me. discussion, yes. Um, yeah. But I guess, I guess, I, I, so I remember being, staying, um, uh, in a hotel in Rome not very long ago, just next to Santa Maria Sopra Minerva, and, and reading, um, reminding myself of, of what the meaning behind Bernini's elephant and, and obelisk sculpture was there, and thinking how incredibly complicated uh, our historians have made this, and what, and how, how unlikely it was that most of, you know, Giovanni average walking along a Roman street would necessarily get the whole complexity. I guess, I guess this goes back to another question though for Georg maybe. Um, so one of the things that the small intimate sculpture often has is, is really complex subject matter. I mean, I think that's, I mean, sometimes that's true for garden sculpture and other pieces as well, but those come on, onto the market less, less regularly. And then that's opposed to great sort of monumental portrait sculpture or the sort of obvious propagandist sculpture, which has to be relatively easy to grasp. Do you think that, um, the complexity of, of, of storytelling and subject matter is, you know, is actually a, a, an issue at all, or is it something that people just sort of again jump over? Does it add to the um, the, the pleasure in a in a in a in a sculpture when you know that um, it's you know when you know the whole the whole um, story that sits behind it? What do you think? How do you? How, and subject matter, especially in Kunstkammer art, can be can be immensely challenging. Look, I, I think, look, uh, a story behind an object is always helpful and always fantastic. And um, very often we can talk about one object half an hour and, and it gets better and better and, the, and, and the, the, the group is getting bigger and larger and larger in, in Maastricht when you talk about one piece and when we open the secret drawers and we show the sculpture from behind and the people can touch it. So this is what it is all about, um, collecting and, and loving these items. and. Um, so I think it's wonderful if you have a story behind it, if you can 
very often. But if it's a complicated, Gail, sorry to interrupt, but if yeah. it's a complicated subject, you know, Roman myth that we don't all know off by heart that, uh, uh, or, or even maybe these days a problematic story like, like you know, the, the abduction of young women by centaurs yeah. or, um, mm -hmm. you know, what, what happens then? Does subject matter sometimes get in the way? I know what you mean. Um, I don't think it's, it's, this cannot be helpful sometimes. You're totally right. So, um, but um, we always try to, to explain to the, to the visitors or to the art, to the art lovers um, all the details of, of all the stories and all the background. And sometimes they're interested and you can, you can easily feel some, uh, sometimes that they're not really interested in them. They just want to look at the sculpture and look at the piece because they admire the, the, the piece like it is. But um, um, I would say it's 50-50. Some of the collectors really want to have the background and they want to have the story and some of them, they just want to admire the things. So it's, I think it's the same like, like 500 years ago. Um, yeah. Mark, do you care what, what your sculptures represent? I mean, what the, what the subject matter is? You know, I do in, in as much as it enriches my understanding of the piece. Now I'm looking, let's say, I, so I've, Hercules and the lion, you know, I'm pretty sure I've got that down pat. I know exactly what that's all about. <laughs> and, and, and I like the accessibility of that. You know, when I first saw it, I knew exactly what the subject was. And so, so I think, <clears throat> so, so there is that. Um, the other thing, Luke, that is provenance can be very interesting. You know, so, um, so, you, do you, so if for you, does it matter who owns something? In the it adds, it adds, uh, Forgive That's me, a layer, a layer, a patina to it, and and sometimes they're very, very interesting. I I, um, I, I have a work uh, that was owned by the richest woman in England at one point, um, next to the Queen, um, and it was it was fascinating. Um, you know, to to you know when I researched and I just put her name into Google. So, you know, you can be somebody, you know, who has no, you know, I'm not a curator, but I can punch a name into Google and and find out all sorts of interesting things. And, and it does add to the, to the feeling of it because, you know, when a work has been in a great collection, a collection that somebody really was focused on, it, it, uh, it, it, that brings something to the work. I think that's a very good note to end on because what we, we started with was the formation of a great collection. And now we finished with that idea that pieces move from from great collection to great collection. Um, yours is one of them, Mark. That's happened because of um, the advice and the, um, and, the, um, and the extraordinary sourcing of material that Catherine and Georg have, have done over the, the years. And I know not, not just them. So there's a, there's a whole community of us um, listening and, and, and participating in that sense of how things come together. I love that idea that, that, the, that these works, the ones that are not attached to pedestals, have this kind of, again, this independent life, this energy that, that moves them from place to place, that, that, that allows them to become the firework in the, in the room, that allows them to, to, to share your space in a particular way and to jump over time um, to, to in, in an extraordinary way to that moment where you can hope that the piece that you're holding was held by the sculptor who, who made it, and sometimes where you can even see those fingerprints um, imprinted in the terracotta or, or the wax. There's something very personal and, and very exciting. And I quite agree that although sculpture can be intimidating sometimes, that if you make that jump, the, the intimacy and the, and the excitement of that, of that form of encounter is very different from looking at painting, which can of course be marvelous, but which is all about entering a, a different realm, a different space. Um, that, that sense of shared space with the piece, but also with everybody who's handled it and owned it and made it. Um, and there can be several people who made it too. It makes it really um, remarkable. So can I finish by saying a huge thank you um, to Alex and to the London Art Week for organizing this event. I, I look forward to London Art Week, usually in a more physical way than, than is possible. Um, this, this, for me this year, but, um, um, and I, I think it's one of the great things in the, in the, in the art calendar. Um, um, it's helped hugely by support of collectors, of, of advisors and of dealers. And um, so I'm just gonna hand over, say thank you hugely to 
all of you, to Georg, to Mark, and to Catherine, um, and hand back now, I think, to, to, to Alex, by the, by the looks of things, for a, a final word. But thank you very much yes. for, uh, um, for, for, for this fascinating conversation for me, and thank you, everybody, for, for joining us. Alex. <laughs> Thank Just you. to say thank you to all of you for participating and making this such an interesting talk. I was fascinated. Um, and Mark, wonderful. Thank you so much for giving us your personal view of everything. And clap to everybody. And thank you. I hope you all enjoyed it. Thank you, Luke. Thank you.